Dr. L, and I'm going to talk to you about Mendelian inheritance. And really specifically today, we're going to focus on patterns of inheritance. So this only applies to eukaryotic organisms. In eukaryotic organisms, like ourselves, you've got cells, and within the cells are nuclei, plural is nucleus, and you will have pairs of chromosomes. Here we'll make a long pair, and we'll make a short pair. Okay. And on those chromosomes are found genes, right? So a gene is a sequence of DNA that encodes a unique RNA. And genes occur in different alleles. And alleles are versions of a gene. Okay, and here we've got our pairs of chromosomes. The red is supposed to be depicting maternal inheritance. That's the copy you got from your mom, your biological mother. And the blue is supposed to be depicting paternal inheritance. Chromosomes, which are what these lines are depicting, carry genes. And genes occur in alleles. So since for each chromosome you have a pair, the maximum number of alleles that you can have as an individual is two, okay? And when we're talking about alleles for genes, there's a variety of symbolism that occurs out there, but one really common pattern is to use letters for symbolism. So we often might say this letter is representing a dominant allele. And this lowercase letter is representing a recessive allele. So what do I mean by that? A dominant allele means an allele that always shows the associated phenotype. And I'll get to that in a moment. And a recessive allele you can will only show its phenotype if it's the only type of allele present. So only shows associated phenotype if there's no dominant present. Okay. So let me add another slide to this. Hold on one second and insert new slide. Okay. All right. So let's look at some other terminology. If we stick with those, if that A or little big A or little A being symbols for alleles, then, and, and big A is the dominant, and little a is the recessive, then we can have three possible genotypes or combinations of alleles in any one individual person or creature. They could be this, they could be this, or they could be this, right? And the names for when you have only, like you have two copies of alleles that are identical, like this and this, we call that pattern homozygous. We call this middle pattern, in contrast, well, whoops, zygous. We call this middle pattern heterozygous. And this can really all seem like gobbledygook unless you pair it with like an actual example, right? So let's do that next. So let's pair it with, let me add another slide in here. Let's pair it with the example of albinism. 
So albinism means no pigment coloring in the eyes, hair, or skin. And these individuals are very susceptible to um, damage, harmful UV damage and mutation, so to skin cancers and eye cancers, so melanoma. So, um, and it's a phenotype that's seen in a lot of different vertebrate eukaryotes, including humans, snakes, deer, all sorts of different things, rabbits, okay? And so in this case, it's due to, or it's related to a gene called the tyrosinase gene, or TYR. And it's very common to assign the symbol A to this particular gene for genetics problems like what I'm working. So in this case, the dominant allele means working, functional, tyrosinase, and the recessive allele is a loss of function, mutant, okay? So it's no, you know, no working tyrosinase. So we can make a relationship between the three possible genotypes I was just showing you and the two different phenotypes, albino or not albino, that can occur in people and, and lots of other animals. So the genotype, which is what particular alleles of a gene do you have in your genome, and the phenotype are related. So if you are this, you are not an albino. If you are this, you are not an albino. And this is the genotype that shows what dominance means because here having one working copy, this big A, is what's controlling or showing or overshadowing or dominant in the phenotype. And this little a is really masked, which is what it is to be a recessive allele. This genotype is the individual that is albino. Okay, and once you know that, you can do some genetic problems. So you can do, you can take that scenario and you can work some problems. Like for example, you have parent one, Who's this? And parent two, who's this? You can ask questions like, A, what is their phenotype? And knowing the information that I just shared, you could say parent two is an albino person and parent one is not albino but they're also referred to as being a carrier because they do carry the albino associated allele in their genome. You can also ask the question, what is the chance of an albino baby? And so you could say, we've got this genotype and they have a baby with somebody of this genotype. So what's the chance that they produce an albino baby? Well, first to do that, you have to say, what haploid gametes are they capable of producing? During meiosis, the chromosomes will be separated. And so they are gonna be haploid. So they're only gonna have one A within them. And so the gametes that this person can produce are gonna be either this or this because those are the two possible alleles that they have to contribute to gametes. The gamete will only have one letter A in it because it's a haploid gamete, so it got one of the chromosomes from the pair and only one. This individual only has little a in their genome, so regardless of which chromosome makes it into their gametes, their egg or their sperm, they're always going to be carrying little a. So the genotype is always that. What we can do next is we can use a tool called a Punnett square to model the possible offspring. And so we can take the, 
the um, gametes from parent one and put them up there, and the gamete from parent two and put it over here. There's the gamete from parent two, here's the gamete from parent one, here's the other gamete from parent one. And we can use the cells of the Punnett square, it's a one by two Punnett square, to model fertilization events. If this gamete and this gamete got together, you would have this diploid individual produced as a result of that fertilization event. If this gamete and this gamete got together, you would have a fertilization event that gave rise to this diploid genotype. This person would be albino, and this person would be not albino. So the chance or the probability of an albino child would be 50% or 1 over 2 because half of the potential offspring from the gametes that are possible here are going to result in this combination, this diploid individual. So we can solve all kinds of interesting things that way. Sometimes traits of interest are recessive. In this case, this is an example of a recessive trait, and other times they're dominant. Another way of um, projecting or sharing um, these sorts of um, inheritance problems is to use a pedigree. And so let me show you, let's make one of those. Very common in human genetics to do pedigree analysis. So in pedigree is kind of like a fancy word for showing the family tree. So in pedigree analysis, what you will generally have is you will have, you will show um, matings like this. You'll have circles for females, a line showing a mating, and here is a male. So circles are female, and squares are male. And then you will have a line of descent, and you'll see what offspring those people produced. So let's say that that couple had two daughters and one son. We would show it like that. And let's say that that son had a baby with this woman, and she had one brother. And this was their parents. That was the mom, and this was the dad, okay? And then let's just say that that, um, you know, that resulted in these children. Let's say they had three children, a girl, a girl, and a boy, okay? And what we would say in this is pedigree is this was the first generation, this was the second generation, and this was the third generation. Another common thing in doing pedigree analysis is that we fill in the circles if they are affected. So this would be an affected female, and this would be an affected male. And affected means like they have the trait of interest, this genetic trait of interest that you're talking. It might be an illness, it might be something adverse, or it might just be something interesting like a smooth chin versus a cleft chin. Right? It doesn't necessarily mean something with a negative health come. It's just something, some aspect of phenotype that is controlled by genetics, that is genetically inherited. So let's say that this particular person was affected, and let's say we're, tra we're talking about albinism. So if we know that that person is albino from doing an interview with this family, we know their genotype, so we can assign it. Little a, little a. Is, is, the, is the genotype required to be albino? In order for this son to have a little a, little a genotype, we know that this parent had to have one allele that was little a, and this parent had to have one allele that was little a. Okay. So if we said if mom was unaffected, her circle was open, then we know that her genotype 
had to be this because she didn't have albinism, but she did have the little a allele and transmitted it to this person of interest. Now, dad, on the other hand, might have also been a carrier, right? And dad might have not had albinism, but carried that little a allele and been able to transmit it. If both of these daughters here and here did not have albinism, then what we know about them is we know there's at least one big A allele. We don't necessarily know what their second one was, but we know there's at least one, so we'll just put a dash in there to indicate we don't know what the second one is. We know there's at least one because we know this is a recessive condition and we're not seeing it, so they can't be little a, this person and this person can't be little a, little a, right? So we know there's at least one dominant allele, and um, it, they could be big A, big A, or big A, little a, because these parents here and here had both to contribute to their offspring, okay? So looking at this person here, this father, that person inherited that little a allele. They had to have gotten it from at least one of their parents. So if the family tree is as it stands and nobody in this tree was affected, all we really know is that at least one of these parents has, like both of them have big A alleles, but somebody, you know, this one or this one had to have a little a allele in order to transmit it to this generation. So sometimes you can like figure the whole thing out and assign a genotype to everybody in the tree. And sometimes you can just do like sort of a probability or an estimate of who's in the tree, but you can do quite a lot with pedigree analysis. And I'll give you some other linked videos to show solving some of those problems. This is the general idea of a pedigree analysis. So the symbols that I want you to remember, circles for females, squares for males, filled in circles or filled in symbols for affected individuals, right? And wherever there's a mating, it's shown by a line joining, you know, the two that are involved in the mating, okay? And the generations, the newest generation will be at the bottom and the oldest generation will be up at the top, okay? And the way the information for these pedigrees is collected is, um, is typically done with a combination these days of genetic testing and interviewing people. So sometimes maybe grandparents or great-grandparents are no longer available, shall we say, for genetic testing. Um, but you can interview um, the person that you're talking to and you can ask them, like, what do you know about your family history? You know, did they, you know, were either of your grandparents, you know, did they show the albino phenotype? And you could explain what that means and you could work with a genetics counselor to infer that. People might be interested in doing that so that they would know about the possibility of genetic conditions in their offspring. So that's um, a little bit about tracking one gene. And what I want to show you next is a little bit about predicting gametes when you're tracking two genes. So I'm going to insert a new slide. Okay, and let's think now about two gene scenarios. So let's think about scenarios where you've got two genes and they're on different chromosomes to keep things simpler, okay? So let's throw in, we've, we've got our A gene, which can exist in this allele or this allele. Let's throw in a B gene. And it could be the dominant allele or the recessive allele. Okay, and we can just, um, we, what we could do, we could assign another phenotype to this. We could say that this is associated with no cystic fibrosis. And this allele is associated with cystic fibrosis. So in this example, this is a real human thing, okay? The A gene is, is the tyrosinase gene that I was just discussing. And the B gene is a gene called the CFTR gene, which is associated with a condition, a recessive condition called cystic fibrosis. So this is another recessive condition. So let's say now we've got a scenario where we have an individual. Let's look at genotypes. 
and phenotypes. We've got two genes and they're on different chromosomes which we show by putting a semicolon in between. So let's say we've got this individual. They're homozygous dominant for the A gene and the B gene. And their phenotype in this regard is going to be no, not albino, and no, I'm going to say CF for cystic fibrosis, okay? If they were instead fully recessive at both alleles, or at both genes, they would be albino, and they would have cystic fibrosis, okay? If they are heterozygous, at both positions. They're going to be carriers for both conditions, but show neither. So not albino and no CF. They could be heterozygous at one position and homozygous either dominant or recessive, and I've drawn homo homozygous recessive at the, B, at the B gene. And in this case, they would be not albino, but they'd be a carrier for albinism. And they would have cystic fibrosis, okay? Or they could be this, not albino, but a carrier for it, and no CF, okay? You know, or so on. And you can see that there are several other genotypes that we could write out that this list would go on, but in all cases there would be two A's and two B's, and there would be all different in the human situation there would be like all possible combinations of the of the dominant and the recessive and in each case you could look at the genotype and you could relate it to a phenotype that can be predicted knowing the genotype so given that let's work a genetic problem that includes two genes so i'm going to insert another new slide and i'm going to say let's say that we've got this individual That's their genotype. This is parent one, okay? So they're carriers for both. So they have no, al no, they're not albino, and they do not have CF. They're carriers for both. And let's say that they meet somebody else, and they decide they want to have a baby together, and that somebody else is the same genotype. Okay, so there are two individuals with identical genotypes that happen to meet and have are going to have a baby together and they want to know what is their chance of having a baby that is albino and has cystic fibrosis. So the first thing we would have to do is we would have to ask what gametes can a person with that genotype produce? What kinds of eggs and what kinds of sperm with regards to these two genes of interest? And so what we would see is they can make, they'll be able to make haploid gametes 1A and 1B, just 1A, just 1B, but it'll be all the different possible combinations. So you'll be able to make gametes like this, gametes like this, and gametes like this, and gametes like this. There are four classes of gametes. And each of them is haploid, and those are their genotypes. They don't have phenotypes because they're just gametes, right? So they're potential, but not like showing a phenotype yet. But these are the four genotypes of the gametes. If I want to know what the chance is that this mating, P1 by P2, will produce a child that has albinism and cystic fibrosis, then I could use that information that I've just gotten and I can set up a Punnett square. So here were our four, our four gametes for the four different possible combinations. I can set up a four by four Punnett square. So I've got this gamete, I've got this gamete, and I'm circling them just to remind myself that they're gametes. I've got this one, and I've got this one. And those would be the gametes from parent one. And parent two would produce these gametes, the same ones. This, 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 and this. OK, 
Okay. All right. So, and I'm going to have a four by four Punnett square. And here are the cells that represent what could happen if those gametes combine during a fertilization event, what the diploid offspring could potentially be. So I just merge them together, and this is what I get. Hopefully I won't make a mistake on this. Each should just have a semicolon between to remind us that A and B are on different chromosomes. Takes a minute. It's a little tedious doing this with two genes. It's super tedious doing this with tracking three genes, which is why people tend to use something called branched diagrams, which I won't show you, but you can look up if you're interested. Okay, so I filled in all those genotypes. Now what does that tell me about my question? What's the chance of getting an offspring that has albinism and cystic fibrosis together? Well, let's go through and assign phenotypes to each of these. Here we're going to have, I'm just going to use ALB for albino. And I'm going to use CF for has cystic fibrosis. Okay, because that's what I'm interested in here. So if I look here I won't, at, at this square, no albinism, no cystic fibrosis. So I'm going to leave that off. If I look here, it'll be no albinism and no cystic fibrosis because we've got the dominant alleles present. Same is true here. Same is true here. Right. So in those squares where I've got underlined, you're not going to see cystic fibrosis or albinism. You're not going to see it here, you're not going to see it here or here, you're also not going to see it here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. In nine of them, I'm, we've got no albinism and no CF. Okay, nine out of 16. And then let's say, well, Let's see, where, where have we got um, albinism, which would be little a, little a, and not cystic fibrosis? Well, here, I've got albinism, but not cystic fibrosis. Here, I've got albinism, but not cystic fibrosis. And here, I've got albinism, but not cystic fibrosis. In three out of 16 of those squares, I've got albinism, but no CF. Where do I have no albinism, but I have CF? That would be any big A in there, but a little b, little b. So let's look for that. So if we go through, I'm like, okay, I'll draw a little circle here. I see that here. I see no albinism, but I see cystic fibrosis. No albinism, but I see cystic fibrosis. No albinism, but I see cystic fibrosis. That's three of those squares again. 3 sixteenths, I've got no albinism, but I have CF in those offsprings. Okay, still that wasn't what I was interested in, but the only thing left is this square right here. In that square we see little a, little a, little b, little b, which gives us albinism plus cystic fibrosis, and that's one out of the sixteenth squares. So I can say that that phenotype ratio is 9 to 3 to 3 to 
to 1. And I can also say that I have a 1 16th chance, the probability of albinism plus CF is 1 at a 16th. Right? 1 at a 16th is the p-value, right? And that's the answer to my question. So that's what I could tell that couple if they came into me for genetic counseling. Given their genotypes, the probability of your baby having both albinism and cystic fibrosis is 1 16th. You know, and then they would have information as they went about their family planning. And so um, this video is long enough. I'm going to leave this with, uh, I'm going to conclude with that. And that is a little bit about the inheritance of either one or two genes and how you can go about solving um, some genetic problems using both a Punnett square or I showed you a simple example of a pedigree analysis too. Have a great day and I'll see you soon.